Right, what I wanted to talk about today was the principles of generative valve repair. Many people in this room have hel helped me learn a lot of this, so a lot of this will be a summary for you, but for some of you, it, I hope it will be educational. These are my disclosures. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the selection of prosthesis bands and rings, and that's something that Javier and I have been working on trying to become a little bit more objective, how we try and explain that in terms of slides, but we're not going to talk specifically about the rings that I've been involved with, with Edwards and Medtronic. So this slide I show often when I give talks around the world, and I do it because of the subheading from valve analysis to valve reconstruction. And the, the key take home there is the importance of, of valve analysis in terms of planning the types of operations you'll do. And what I mean by that is historically, if you looked at in, in the history of mitral surgery, quadrangular resection, then triangular resection, more recently loops in Europe, a lot of centers successfully adapt almost a single approach to the majority of pathology. And that was sort of the opposite of where the Carpante sort of progression was from quadrangular resection toward a whole textbook of repair strategy. And valve analysis is really is the key to reconstruction. And I think it's something that we've uh, really taken very seriously here. And you know that on different valves, we, are, we have lots of different strategies. And that's what I want to try and summarize for you today. You do a valve analysis on echocardiography, and you do it in the operating room. And these are all the things that you think about when you're thinking about how are you going to do a valve repair. The size of the valve, the segmental leaflet height, you often see us look at hypoplastic segments next to very tall segments. The commissures, and particularly clefts, are something early on that we learned are important in terms of targeting areas you'll do a resection as well as avoiding residual leaks. Chordal conditions are very important in degenerative disease. It's not just chordal rupture. You have chordal elongation and chordal restriction. So it's one disease where you'll see all of the different chordal pathologies in a single patient. And missed primary lesion, particularly chordal restriction, is a common cause. We've done reoperations here on patients. Annular geometry is important because just like I mentioned, sometimes you'll have patients that have very severe dilatation. Sometimes you'll have patients with minimal dilatation. Sometimes you'll have patients with inadequate tissue. So part of your ring strategy is around the amount of tissue that you have. And then the ventricular shape and function is very important in degenerative disease. Of course, it's the primary mechanism in ischemic regurgitation. But remember, degenerative patients that present with ventricular dysfunction can have opposing lesions. They can have prolapse in your eyes on that, but they can have tethering posteriorly. And these all affect your strategy, how you think about doing a valve repair. This is Carpante's functional classification. Again, today we're going to focus just on the first half of this, which are things that you'll see commonly in degenerative disease. In terms of type 1 dysfunction, this is the most common lesion that we see in atrial fibrillation. And what that is is primarily increase in the SL dimension from an increase in the circumference of the posterior aspect of the annulus. You can see the anterior leaflet really can't touch the posterior annulus because the dimension from commissure to commissure is increased, dropping out the base of the valve. That's the most common type. This is an increasingly common type of type 1 dysfunction, which is mitral annular calcification. This is obviously a more, a more challenging case to do valve repair or replacement in. Um, and the primary mechanism here is dilatation of the annulus and, and then freezing of the hinge points. And this is an area where the indentations become involved with the calcification process, and that's the target for repair. He's trying to get a smooth surface of coaptation posteriorly. Just for completeness sake, this really it doesn't involve primary degenerative disease, but leaflet perforation is the other way you could have severe regurgitation and have normal leaflet motion. So in patients where you don't, where the plane of the annulus, the leaflets come into the plane of the annulus, as you can see here, and you have severe regurgitation, you always have to think about leaflet perforation or annular perforation. That's 
easy to think about in the context of endocarditis, but also at post repair, that's a common source of a residual leak and something that we'll look for. Now, surgical strategy for type one is broken down here. Um, you wanna look at the leaflet integrity and annular dilatation perforations. We typically treat with patch augmentation, annular dilatation, primarily treated by annuloplasty, and patch augmentation is also quite useful in patients that have small valves and annular calcification, because sometimes you have to patch those open clefts because you can't close them because of the calcification, so that we usually will do something called a patch overlay for that. Right now we're using decellularized pericardium, but we've used glordaldehyde fixed pericardium mostly. Um, in the re-op setting, we, we always will use Cardiacel now. Um, this is mitral annular calcification, and basically, just to, to simplify that, this could be an entire talk. In less severe cases, we tend to oversize the annuloplasty. So that's why I said you can change your annuloplasty strategy based on the height. We'll preserve excess leaflet height, oversize the annuloplasty, because we're going to have the calcium inside the orifice. We're going to be behind the hinge point, so we have to be a little thoughtful about not putting in too small of a ring. And of course, you guys have seen us do unconventional annuloplasty where we may take a triad, turn it upside down. We may only placate one side of a valve where we can put sutures. So usually we will attempt to do some sort of annuloplasty, but oftentimes you're not able to do a conventional annuloplasty, Robin. Yeah, so su suture replacement are three, two strategies, main strategies. One is an SH needle. You want to get a bigger needle and think, I always say, think like you're putting in a subclavian line. Take your needle and bounce off the calcium. You really want to feel the calcium with your needle because then you're going to be away from the coronary artery. And usually if you start a little bit behind in the atrium and bounce off the calcium, you'll, you'll be in a, in a reasonable place to attach an annuloplasty ring. The other is, is a ventricularly placed pledget. And so if, again, if you take primarily SH needles with pledgets, go inside the ventricle, you need to go work between the secondary cords. You can then put a mattress suture like you would normally place for a valve replacement and bounce outside the calcium. So those are the two primary techniques that we've used in, for, to place annuloplasty rings around calcification, and you and I did a case last week where that was a combination of, of those two maneuvers, and usually it's some of both um, if the calcification is really severe. And then, of course, you have targeted abrevement and patch augmentation. That's if the calcification extends into the leaflet. And then the least common, the most talked about and the least common is on block resection. Um, that is something that we really reserve for very select cases. We really learn to work around the calcium as to work at, at directing at the calcium. We tend to now, I think, work around the calcium. Now, type 2 is, is the, what I really came here to review with you. This is a, a spectrum of disease that involves excess leaflet motion in the annular plane. And early on, we've been very interested in the subclassification of degenerative disease from minimal tissue to excess tissue from small valve to large valve and the characteristics of that isn't really part of this talk but just to review patients on the side of minimal tissue tend to have tend to be older tend to have more regurgitation because they tend to present earlier with cortical rupture so patients with fiber lack sufficiency tend to have relatively short histories because they don't tolerate holosystolic regurgitation. They have smaller valves and usually single segment prolapse. On the other side of the spectrum of patients that have excess tissue, and we tend to call that form fruce barlow or barlow depending on the size of the annulus, but usually more than one segment's involved. You have excess volume and height they have long histories because the majority of them start with cortical elongation and progress to cortical rupture. So they have mid-systolic leaks to begin with. They tend to have large everything by the time you operate on them. And that's basically a, a way to think about valve repair. This was something that I think it was 2008, Denani and I wrote an editorial that I think was the beginning of the next journey here, which was about that figure helping you design repair strategy.
that was really the, the, I think, one of the realizations here about how we were going to think about our selective repair strategy based on the, on the size and height of leaflets. And I think that was one of the real turning points in our program in terms of our strategy and valve repair. So let's walk through these four examples. This is the isolated prolapse minimal tissue. And I want all of you to pay attention to the echo. You can learn these things on echo. Valve analysis starts looking at echocardiograms. It's a small valve. You've got an isolated prolapse there. And you see it actually can be very subtle. And if you look at the valve, you see thin chordae. It's not a very large valve. You look at the anterior leaflet size and see how small this valve is. And you see these thin chordae. So you've got an anteriorly directed jet. You've got thin chordae and a tendency to prolapse posteriorly. This is the most common one that you see. And this is the, again, a middle segment posterior leaflet prolapse with ruptured core, but notice the increased volume in P2. So prolapsing segments develop myxomatous change. We don't know why that is, but typically a prolapsing segment, if it prolapses long enough, will develop height and volume from myxomatous change in the leaflet. And that's what you see here. And this is the most common one that we see. And the key to making that diagnosis is look at the adjacent segments. They're small and they're normal. You see, and historically, we would take all of this out. Now you'll never see us do that. We will preserve some of this tissue in some sort of strategy, and we'll walk through that to create coaptation. This is the valve to be the most careful. And this is the multi-segment prolapse, excess tissue, small valve size. So this is the, the real case of Form Fruits Barlow's, and, and you guys have all seen these. These are the ones we work the hardest to really make sure that we have a, a, a strategy that will accommodate the tissue, correct the prolapse, and we have to be very careful with our aneoplasty strategy. So you see this is diffuse prolapse. All the segments are involved. All the segments have myxomatous disease. Very tall segments. P2 can cover the entire orifice of the valve. See, the key is the height of the anterior leaflet here. It's actually a very small valve. So you have a posterior leaflet that's bigger than your ring size, and your aneoplasty at the end of the day is going to be small, but regardless of what you do, it's not going to be a large aneoplasty. That's the one that we are take the most care with. And this, of course, is the Barlow valve. And what really sets apart Barlow's is not just the multi-segment nature of it, but the size of the valve. Here you can see completely different morphology on the echocardiogram in terms of the septolateral dimension. And what that means is that this valve is going to have excess tissue and actually room to work in. So there are lots, again, different strategies to do a valve repair for this. But you can see that the size of the annulus has changed the dynamic a little bit. The other thing I want you to notice there is the height of the posterior leaflet before we did anything. You saw the placement of that closure line. It was in the midline. We're going to talk a lot about that in a minute. So there are two things I want you to think about as we sort of summarize our current thinking in degenerative valve repair. There are two key points. One of them is this, and that's your focus. If you had one thing that you concentrate on, it's the height of the posterior leaflet. By leaflet prolapse, you've got ruptured A2 cords, you've got all, you know, you've got giant angular dilatation, you have calcification in the corner of the valve. You can have a lot more things that are more dramatic in terms of pathology that when you open the atrium and you look at. But I just want you to focus on this posterior leaflet height, because that's the key to a successful repair, to picking a reconstructive strategy, and really taking complex things and simplifying them. Once you get a normal posterior leaflet, this gets to be a whole lot easier, this field. The other thing is the annulus. And we talked a little bit about that in one of the questions at the beginning. But I want you to really sort of get to the next level in terms of thinking about the annulus again. Our program, we used to put a physio ring in everybody. Then we had the physio too. Then we, you know, we went from ring to ring, sort of using it almost all or none. And I think today we do it much more selectively. And it's something that, again, I think has helped us get to the next level. And I'll try and talk about that for a little while in these videos. So you have two main types of annuloplasties. One is done with posterior reduction. 
you should think about these as a reduction annuloplasty. You're reducing the length between commissures or trigons, depending on how where you place your sutures. But you're basically decreasing septolateral dimension, and you're doing that primarily by taking a larger C-shaped annulus and taking a smaller C-shaped ring and placating it into the ring. It's a reduction. A, a ring, a full ring, a semi-rigid or rigid full ring is called a remodeling annuloplasty. The reason Carpante used the phrase remodeling is because it fixes the valve in a systolic position. He's trying to take the valve that normally gets smaller when the heart squeezes and fix it in that systolic position. It's a more aggressive reduction. It's a fixed reduction of the septolateral dimension. In addition to reducing the length posteriorly, you now fix the valve in a septolateral dimension. So you can imagine they have different sort of reactions at the leaflet level when you're doing valve repair. And this sort of is, is our, our first attempt trying to sort of summarize how we think about it today. And that is when you do a leaflet repair, and you'll see in some of these videos, if we have a, a saline test that's spot on, our saline test has no residual leak, perfect placement, we look like we've got our height correct. Remember, our annuloplasty sutures create an annuloplasty effect. When we snap those to the drape, you're basically, in effect, starting to placate the circumference posteriorly. If that's really good, we tend to go with bands. If our saline test is abnormal, you'll invariably see us use rings. Why? Because we want to fix the valve in a systolic position to continue this movement toward trying to get the leaflets to go out. So you will almost never see us take a band, and you'll see us switch from band to ask for more sutures if our saline test isn't normal. That's a very common reaction. One of the first things we'll do is, is try and fix the valve in a systolic position. On the other hand, saline test is completely normal, particularly in young people. We tend to leave the valve more open. There's no question, there's a, and I don't have time to go through that literature, but functional stenosis in small valve sizes is, is a real phenomenon in highly active people. So we have to be, that's one of the reasons we're more thoughtful on that side. The other thing is the coaptation line. And that's why I mentioned systolic motion in one of my questions to you, because the single thing that clues you into systolic motion is the coaptation line. And it, we, we, you, know, you can get systolic motion without an annuloplasty. You can get one with a band, you can get one with a ring, a rigid ring, a semi-rigid ring, it doesn't matter. You can always get systolic motion if you have a height leaflet discrepancy versus septolateral dimension. But it is going to be more common with a fixed septolateral dimension. It will be. So we tend to, again, think about coaptation lines and we may go to a strategy of taking out commissural sutures and just doing a placation posteriorly without crossing the commissures. I mentioned taking out two sutures. If we have a posteriorly, a, a, a suture, a, a closure line that we're not happy with, one of the advantages of a band is I can make it even larger by taking out sutures at the top. So if I'm not sure how that's going to line up, that's what I'll do. And the opposite is also true. If my coaptation line is perfect, and, I, and, I, and I'm worried that I have a very, I, I've done a very complex repair. That's a case where we may go to ring. So the, play, the closure line is more useful for band if it's in the middle of the valve, if it's posteriorly displaced, then that may just, part of this is dealer's choice. There's not really, a, this is part of the art of doing this, but I do think one of the reasons you're seeing is use about 50% bands right now is because we're, we're trying to, to have the largest orifice we can and have the minimal risk of systolic motion as we've moved toward more leaf, less resection and trying to deepen closure lines. That's the other thing that changed here. We were religious about sliding leafoplasty. Now it's a much less common thing because we're trying to create deeper closure lines, but that needs us to be a little more clever. Let's look at a couple of examples of this. Here's a 51-year-old patient who's very active. That's the whole reason to put this here. So you've got a 51-year-old patient that's very active. Here's his echocardiogram. And you can see this prolapse posteriorly. And I'll just show you that to show you what that looks like. So here's a patient that's got minimal tissue, 
and he's got a prolapse of P2, P3. You can see this sort of segmental prolapse in the area of an abnormal indentation, which is common. But this will make the point, I think, of, of band and ring. See, the adjacent segments were normal. Myxomenous disease in the prolapsing segment. Lots of ways you can repair this valve. And usually if we have a prolapse in an indentation like that, the two techniques we'll do is either application as you're seeing here or we'll use the the cleft is one of the lines for a triangular resection. They both work well, but you can see how we're sort of creating a single surface of coaptation here by placating this, this multi-segmented cleft. But this is what I wanted to show you. You see you have a posteriorly displaced closure line. You have a small valve size. Now, this is the honors part. You see the cords aren't very good here. They're thin. It's fiber elastic deficiency. If we're not competent, comfortable with the cordal integrity, we'll tend to add a Gore-Tex cord just for security's sake down the road. That was not to do correction. But you can see the posteriorly displaced closure line in a very small valve and a very active person. And this is the sort of patient that we would have put a physio ring in four years ago, and not thought about it twice. And of course, now I don't think we would necessarily do that. Because see, I've got a perfect saline test. Why not just do a posterior placation? You obviously are going to leave the valve more open in systole because you haven't fixed the, 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 the anterior commissural area as aggressively. So let's look at one other case. This is a patient that's got bileaflet prolapse, 56-year-old guy. Of course, he's like me. He has sedentary work. He's not running seven miles a day. Here's his echo. And let's look at this valve. Yeah, that's the, that's the uh, reason. That, that I think that you can see this pathology. I focused on the sedentary and chuckled to myself. So again, these sort of patients where you, where you have bileaflet prolapse, and these, all these points get made looking at some of these, and we'll just walk through different videos till 9 o'clock. If you look at this valve, you've got posterior and anterior leaflet prolapse, and you've got pathology on both sides. In this particular case, if, if we have a height discrepancy, I, I don't, we, we tend to do triangular resection to try and reshape the anterior leaflet to fit a sizer. So it just, we don't routinely do triangular resection, but we would in a case like this where you had this volume expansion in the height. But the key here is, is that we're going to sort of work on both sides of this. Again, we start typically now with our annuloplasty sutures where we could go either way. And that's a technique also that we're using quite frequently now, which we call free edge remodeling. As we connect the, the as we decrease the length of a posterior, of the margin of the posterior leaflet, that creates tension, tension on adjacent segments and tends to pull the valve down. So it's an excellent technique to correct tendency to prolapse. It's much like leaflet free edge shortening in an aortic valve repair. Now you see that? So 36, so it's a Barlow type valve. Again, 
we normally would be thinking about whether we'd use a physio or a physio tube for this, and I, I don't have time to go through that scenario, but that's basically based on the shape. But you see, we went for a band here, and the reason we went for a band is why? Modesto. We went for the band because the anterior, the closure line is displaced. It's not at the bottom of the valve like the first case I showed you. And that's why I said this position really gets us thinking again at the very end. We will not make a final decision until we've actually looked at that. Then I'll just show you one other case, 35-year-old patient. Again, very active, severe MR. Fun case shows the diversity of pathology that we talk about in degenerative disease. And look at the difference here. You've got restriction of the P1 segment. So it's a prolapse case, but you have, don't have tissue in P1. Then you have excess tissue and prolapse in P2. But so you have a hypoplastic P1. It's tethered in the ventricle. And that's, that's the lesion that you don't want to miss. This one everyone's going to get. And so just to show you that strategy, what we, what we need to do is we need to decrease the height and increase the tension on one side of the valve. We need to rebuild the leaflet on the other side of the valve. And so this is a case where we would do sliding leafoplasty, but I, I picked this to show you the ring size, which you'll see in a second. But here we're just going to cut out these secondary cords that are restriction. We'll see we'll detach P1 to raise it and then use this excess height from P2 to raise the height. And it goes back to this theory of 1.5. See, we're going to detach that. And by leaving that off the annulus, that's going to raise that height. And by doing that now, we'll have a, be able to create a coaptation service that will be uniform. And here's the initial saline test, sort of, it's good, it's, I like it. It's a big, giant valve. But you see that there? What do we have there, Javier? <coughs> you see we had a prolapse. Eight, eight. So okay. now here again is a case where we're, where we're more likely, because we're going to need more leaflet work, we're more likely to go to ring. Because we, we know now we, we want to fix the height of the anterior leaflet ideally, as we're doing here at the very end after we've done the annuloplasty. And so, you know, these are all subtle things, but typically if we think we're going to be tailoring the free margin a lot at the end, that's another good reason to think about you know, ring versus band. And of course, the other thing about this case that was interesting was it was a giant dilatation in a very circular valve, which is, fits the sort of shape of this ring perfectly. But you can see by having a systolic ring in, that let us tailor that very carefully. So those are some of the subtleties. That's how we're making those decisions today. In terms of type two, I go back to the leaflet strategy that Ani and I started talking about 10 years ago now. That is, if you have minimal tissue, you do minimal things. It's not just that you use Gore-Tex, but PTFE displacement's a great technique, targeted triangular resection, and we have not gotten away from choral transfer, particularly in the anterior leaf, but we take secondary cords and move it to the margin. But the point is, we're really respecting tissue. Angular compression is a less common technique now, but a very important one in reoperations, and particularly in endocarditis, where you have minimal tissue to decrease the, uh, to decrease the circumference of the posterior annulus, and it also raises height and takes tension off of leaflets. I showed you already an example of free edge plication, which has become a mainstay of ours for tendency to prolapse. And then, of course, barring leaflet segments from one side, and usually it's posterior to anterior, 
is a good way to deal with diffuse anterior leaflet prolapse, again, without any, with minimal resection of the prolapsing segment. Let's walk through a couple of these. So here's an example of a minimal, of a minimal tissue case. You can see thin cords, small valve, thin leaflets, adjacent segments are normal. Again, there are lots of different strategies. We tend not to talk about which strategy. We don't really propose, you know, we could take that valve and repair it with three or four different strategies. I showed you one already where we did a plication. Now we're doing a limited triangular resection. And you saw the piece we took out was just a few millimeters wide. It's not like what the textbooks show, where they always show this pyramid-shaped triangle. We literally just, just took out just the sliver of margin of the leaflet because we're trying to create tension on the margin. And then as we close that, then we have this Gore-Tex cord in case we want to do re either reinforce the support or do further displacement. But again, the, the take home here is minimal tissue, minimal resection. Different ways that you can do minimal resection, but that's the key. And then again, small valve, normal saline test, typically that would be a band at this point. And you can see the, how, how, we would, how, how we sort of would do that and what the final result is. So that's a typical sort of example of a small valve. Let's look at one for plication because that's more less common. This is endocarditis. You have severe regurgitation in endocarditis. By the time you take this out, you're going to have a large defect. So plication is a special technique for minimal tissue. And it's not a common technique. It was a mainstay of degenerative valve repair 20 years ago. It's not very common right now, but it's really important in cases like this. You see we're missing half the posterior leaflet. You could augment that whole leaflet, but an easier, a, a strategy that's very effective is vertical plication. And you can see what we mean is we're just creating a seam. And by vertically displacing the annulus as we tie this, we can, we can plicate the annulus, and now the two leaflet edges come together without any tension. So it's a very good strategy when you're missing tissue from resection, particularly in endocarditis. Plications, I must say, we tend to use rings because we want to reinforce this area of the annulus that we've plicated, and, and it is probably a little more stable. And then here's one that you guys see commonly that you help us with, and that's patients that have had over-aggressive resection or healing after valve repair. So again, it's another example of minimal tissue. It's not just that you have FED. There are lots of examples in degenerative valve repair where you have minimal tissue. And this is a not too uncommon case that we face where patients have either had too aggressive healing or too aggressive a resection and don't have an adequate surface of coaptation. And so in this sort of case, we'll take the ring out and we need to rebuild the posterior leaflet. And there are lots of different ways to do that as well. You can detach it, plicate it. That will raise the height. You can do an augmentation of it. You could cut restricted secondary cords and try and release it and downsize the ring if the ring was taller. So it's not a, there, there are different ways that you'll sort of work your way into that. But the key is recogni recognizing the restriction. You can see we sort of created that annuloplasty effect. And this is a technique, actually, that I think Ahmed taught me, which is patch overlay. Instead of just detaching leaflets and sewing it from the annulus to the margin, we're just laying over a patch over an area that we don't have adequate tissue in, which I like very much. See, so we just sort of taken a triangle, and we're just augmenting segments. And this is what I mentioned when I said we do this in calcified, calcified annulus as well. You don't need to augment the whole leaflet with a sickle-shaped patch. You can just augment segments of the leaflet like we've done here. And just a, one more example of that particular phenomena. You can see here again, tethered leaflets. We don't have a lot. We don't have a, a good surface of coaptation here. It's much more common to see this in reoperations than it is to see excess tissue. 
And again, regardless of your strategy to, re, to rebuild this, you're going to have to rebuild the posterior leaflet. And here is, this, is, the, is the vertical patch, the long patch, to really create a whole new posterior leaflet for coaptation. And so one is a strategy to sort of fill in defects, and one is to really rebuild the entire posterior leaflet. And they both work, and you can see that's actually very complex. Invariably, these valves have, have, are a little smaller in reoperations. But there you can see, again, small valve. If we had a good saline test, trying to go with a band. And then here's a case of calcification. And the funny thing is, you notice we spend most of our time, when I try and explain these things, we spend most of our time talking about minimal tissue. All of us on the front row know that's the harder operation. The big fancy barlow with bileaf foot prolapse is the one that gets cut out all the time, but this is the one that actually will keep you awake because these are much more challenging cases trying to create surface of coaptation. That's that technique of bouncing off the calcium posteriorly. And you can see you're just, you're just trying to almost feel the calcium as you put needles in. And then we need to correct these indentations and prolapses and usually we'll reinforce closing these with pericardium because they're very thin around the calcium or we'll do augmentation of them but we need to create a smooth surface of cooptation which we will do but the key the, the, the key step the key step on that case was the suture technique then to oversize the ring. For excess leaflet tissue, you have three main strategies, leaflet displacement, targeted resections, and sliding leaflet plasty. And I'll show you a couple of examples of those. Here again is a patient that's got severe regurgitation and he has excess tissue. And so there are different ways that you can think about that, but I'll show you this case just because it's very interesting. You've got now the opposite issue. You've got a large valve and you've got excess tissue with diffuse prolapse. So there are different ways again to to sort of tackle that. Look at the initial saline test. You've got complex what appears to be bileaflet prolapse. And so before you get too crazy, you put your annual plasty sutures ring and suddenly, just by decreasing the annulus and now you have the opposing tension, it's starting to look a little more promising. And that's why you shouldn't make a decision about valve replacement in less experienced places until you've actually put some annual plasty sutures in. Because you can see now we've actually the predominant lesion here was tendency to prolapse and type 1 dysfunction. And by recognizing that, that's actually a fairly simple problem to fix. And you can see we've done that with just annuloplasty. So this is tendency to prolapse. It's more misread as bileaf foot prolapse because of billowing. But in fact, really, the primary strategy is just annuloplasty. And that's when, I, when people say, oh, we can fix Barlow with annuloplasty. You're fixing a type 1 dysfunction with tendency to prolapse. It's not a true Barlow. But it shows you that excess tissue can be maneuvered. We oversize that ring because we have excess tissue. We don't want to shorten the height. Here's a more typical example of a Barlow deformity. And again, just gives you the visual of the differences in these valves when we're doing valve repair. You can see the amount of excess tissue here. And so a much more complicated valve to sort of put together a strategy for. However, it's much more forgiving. You actually get two or three swings at this. If your st first strategy doesn't work, invariably you have another strategy that you could use. And you can see that, again, the, the take home here is just recognizing the pathology. Every valve has a different sort of look. Once we put the annual plasty sutures in, we can start to understand the segmental anatomy. You see us marking ink here. This was another. Honey, when did we publish that? Six? Seven? Seven. Yeah, I think it has to be nine or ten years ago. This was an idea that we developed in the old, I don't think, we were still in room 21, I think. And that was that we, you know, Ani took an ink marker one day and he started marking this closure line. The reason we did that was actually 2006 because in 2000, December 2005, Tyrone David published a paper about long-term failure. And we started thinking about co-aptation depth. That was the paper that started that, his presidential address. And we started using ink to help us understand the closure line, which is why you will always see us draw on the valve before we take a picture. But now you can see we use it constantly to sort of understand, do valve analysis. It helps us mark areas that prolapse or restricted and helps us understand indentations or clefts we need to close because they're in the closure line. So ink has become a mainstay. 
And the techniques of this are really beyond the, 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 the topic at hand, other than to say just you can see how when you have multi-segment prolapse, that's why those cases tend to take longer, because you can see we're dealing with lots of pathology here. Again, we're fixing it in a organized fashion, so it's not that there's, a, there's just a strategy to this and we're walking through segment by segment to correct it. And again, an example of a well-displaced posterior line and something that was complex, but actually, you know, over the course of those, that, that three-minute summary of a three-hour operation, we did it segment by segment. And here's another example of very diffuse prolapse. And you can see the thickness and you see this cul-de-sac. All these are the, are the clues that you've got advanced degenerative disease. And when you see that, again, you open up and you have this giant excess tissue. And the, 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 the take home here is, again, do a very careful segmental analysis. It's different than minimal tissue where typically it's one segment. Here there are multiple segments that have pathology in two, terms of cortical elongation, cortical rupture. We have a hypoplastic segment and you've got excess height. So here's a case where, again, you sort of have to start one segment at a time and start on the posterior leaflet, get the height right. Again, there are different ways that you could repair this, but you can see sort of the normal leaflet hiding over here, and typically we'll cut out the tallest segment of the valve as a beginning, and then try and match these height. I go back to that 1.5 centimeter. It's such a good way to think about valve repair, and we spend so much time, when we're down in this hole looking through these loops, what we're really trying to do is sort out how do we get everything to 1.5 centimeters. Almost invariably, the first 45 minutes of an operation in excess tissue is done doing that. And this I've already shown you, which is sliding leafoplasty, where we're moving the leaflet across the annulus to basically change the, the, the length of the posterior leaflet and rebuild a surface area. This is what's called a magic suture. You see us do it commonly. It's a commissural advancement suture. And by taking a mattress suture, it increases the coaptation distal to where we tie it. So a very important technique, particularly in large valves. I think it does it will decrease the risk of, of residual prolapse by creating more tension lateral to the segment. And there again, you can see as you come together and the specific techniques don't really matter, but as we've come together, we keep sort of working through this valve one, one step at a time. And if we have a good saline test at the end, we tend to go with bands today. I'll show you one last case, and this is something a little bit more complicated because now you can see you've got multi-segment prolapse, a very complex jet, and you've got restrictions. So this is the sort of de degenerative case that's gonna take a little bit more thought. And you can see you've got restriction and, and excess tissue. So you've got some areas that prolapse, some areas that are restriction. The calcification or the fibrosis of the papillary muscles makes that all a little bit more interesting. So here we're releasing leaflet. Despite the fact of adjacent prolapse, we actually have to release certain segments as well. So this is that combination of working to create a smooth surface. And then the other thing you can see here is we're detaching leaflets now, aren't we? We're not at the annular level because we have annular calcification. So again, we're trying to respect the calcium. We're working around it. We're above the calcified annulus now. And so we're, we're shortening the leaflets and trying to create a surface of coaptation, but you see we're doing leaflet, leaflet slotting plasty. We're not, we're not at the annular junction this time because the annulus is calcified. And the take home there is even with excess tissue and calcification, there are often ways that you can sort of plan a strategy around this calcium and still respect this idea of 1.5 and then what you may do is have to, again, correct residual areas of prolapse. We're just trying to get to 1.5 first. Typically, get to 1.5, then correct the margin. That's a really good battle plan. So here we got to 1.5, then we corrected the margin. Now you can see we're clearly oversizing. And that's what I mean by oversizing to accommodate the calcification. We were clearly oversizing. And then again, we can go walk through and correct any residual prolapse that we want. And that's an example, again, of sort of all those techniques together. This is the table that, that shows you why we, we are so, um, why we think about so much about which technique we're going to do. This is from a paper that Javier was the first author on that looked at our first 747 patients or 750 patients that were operated on here for degenerative disease. All comers, they all came in. All but one patient had a valve repair um, and 
that was at the time was really unique and you see the title we thought it was pretty unique as well that this was the first of now many papers that have talked about 100 percent repair for degenerative disease but the main point and the one table i picked to show you were the reconstructive techniques used degenerative valve disease is, is a spectrum and if you want to repair 80 percent of valves you can do that with triangular resection or gore-tex or quadrangular resection plication. If you want to repair 100% of valves, you've really got to learn the role of all of these different techniques because it's that last five or seven percent that will get you over 90% and why you see us taking so much time today doing valve analysis and using valve analysis and the lesions as I've tried to show you to, do a, to, to develop a repair strategy that's really individualized for every patient. That's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much.